have been to the zoo. I said I've been to the zoo. <laughs> Mister, I've been to the zoo. Hmm? I'm not sorry. Were you talking to me? I said I went to the zoo and then I walked until I came here. Uh, are you walking north? North? Well, I think so. Let me see. Is that Fifth Avenue? Yes, yes it is. And what is that cross street there? That one to the right? That? That is 73rd Street. And the zoo is around 65th Street. So I've been walking north. <sighs> so it would seem. Good old north. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> but not due north. Uh, well, no. <laughs> not due north. But we uh, call it north. It's northerly. Well, boy. You're not going to get lung cancer, are you? <laughs> no, sir, not from this. No, sir. What you'll probably get is cancer of the mouth. <laughs> and then you'll have to wear one of those things Freud wore after they took one whole side of his jaw away. <laughs> what do they call those things? The, the... A prosthesis? The very thing. A prosthesis. <laughs> You're an educated man, aren't you? Are you a doctor? Oh, no, no. I read about it somewhere. Time magazine, I think. <laughs> well... Time Magazine isn't for blockheads. I suppose not. <sighs> Boy, I'm glad that's Fifth Avenue there. Mm -hmm. I don't like the west side of the park much. Oh? Huh. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if we talk? Oh, right. No, no. Uh, yes, you do. No, really, I don't mind. Yes, you do. No, I don't mind at all. Really. It's, it's a nice day. Yes. Yes, it is. Beautiful. I've been to the zoo. Yes, I think uh, you said uh, so. Uh, 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 I bet you've got TV, huh? Uh, yes. We have two. One for the children. You're married. Naturally. It isn't a law, for God's sake. No, of course not. <laughs> and, and you have a wife? Yes. <laughs> and you have children? Yes, two. Boys? No, girls. Both girls. Are you wanting boys? Well, every man wants a son, but... But that's the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that. And you're not going to have any more kids, are you? No, no more children. Why did you ask me that? How would you know about that? The, the, the way you cross your legs, perhaps, or <laughs> something in the voice, or, or maybe I'm just guessing. Is it your wife? That's none of your business. You understand? Well, you're right. We'll have no more children. That is the way the hook crumbles. Yes, I suppose so. Do you mind if I ask you questions? Well, not really. I'll tell you why, anyway. I, uh, I don't talk to many people, except to say, like, uh, give me a beer, or uh, where's the John, or what time does the feature go on? Keep your hands to yourself, buddy. You know, things like that. Don't say I don't. But, but every once in a while, I like to talk to somebody. Like, really talk. Like, to get to know somebody. And know am all I about it. The guinea pig for today? On a sun drenched Sunday afternoon like this? Who better than a nice married man with two daughters and a. Uh, a dog? Two dogs. No dogs? Oh, that's a shame. You look like an animal, man. <laughs> Cats. Cats. Uh, <laughs> uh, that can't possibly be your idea, no, sir. Your wife and daughters. Uh, is there anything else I should know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have two parakeets. Uh, one for each daughter. Birds. Now, my daughters keep them in a cage in their bedroom. Do they carry disease? 
the, the birds. Oh, I don't believe so. No, that's too bad. If they did, you could set them loose in the house, and the cats could eat them and die. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and what else? What do you do to support your enormous household? <laughs> well, I, I hold an executive position in a small publishing house. We publish uh, textbooks. That sounds nice. Very nice. What do you make? Well, now look here. <laughs> Come on. Well, I make around two hundred thousand a year, but I never carry more than forty dollars uh -huh. with me at any one time. In case you're a holdup man. <laughs> what do you live? Oh, look, I'm not going to rob you, and I'm not going to kidnap your parakeets, or your cats, or your daughters. I live between Lexington and 3rd Avenue on 73rd Street. That wasn't so hard, was it? Look, I don't mean to seem... Yeah, it's just that you don't actually carry on a conversation. You just ask questions, and I'm normally uh, reticent. Why do you just stand there? Oh, I'll start walking around in a little while, and... Maybe later I'll sit down. Oh, say, <laughs> what's the dividing line between upper middle middle class and lower upper middle class? <laughs> <laughs> my dear fellow. Don't my dear fellow me. <laughs> no. Was I being patronizing? Oh, I believe I was. I'm sorry, it's just that your question about the classes bewildered me. And when you're bewildered, you become patronizing? <sighs> I don't express myself too well sometimes. I'm in publishing, not writing. So be it. Well, the truth is, I was being patronizing. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't say that. All right. Who are your favorite writers? Baudelaire and uh, Stephen King? <laughs> <laughs> I like a great many writers. I have a great Catholicity of taste, if I may say so. Now, those two men are fine, each in their own way. Baudelaire is, of course, the far finer of the two, but uh, Stephen King also has a place in our national... Uh, skip it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you know what I did before I went to the zoo today? I walked all the way up Fifth Avenue from Washington Square. All the way. Ah, oh, you're from Greenwich Village. No, I'm not. <laughs> I took the subway down to the village so that I could walk all the way up Fifth Avenue. <laughs> it's one of those things a person has to do. Sometimes a person has to go a very long distance out of his way to come back a short distance correctly. Oh, I thought you lived in Greenwich Village. What were you trying to do? Make sense out of things? Bring order? The old pigeonhole bit? <laughs> well, that's easy. I'll tell you. I live in a four-story brownstone rooming house on the Upper West Side between Central Park West and Columbus Avenue. I live on the top floor, rear, west. It's a laughably small room. And one of my walls is made of beaver board. And this beaver board <laughs> separates my room from another laughably small room. So I assume that the two rooms were once one room. A small room, but not necessarily laughable. The room beyond my beaverboard wall is occupied by a black queen who always keeps his door open. I mean, not always, but always when he's plucking his eyebrows, which he does with Buddhist concentration. <laughs> this black queen has rotten teeth, which is rare. And he has a Japanese kimono, which is also pretty rare. And uh, he wears his kimono to and from the John in the hall, which is pretty frequent. I mean, he goes to the John a lot. He never bothers me, and he never brings anyone up to his room. All he does is pluck his eyebrows, wear his kimono, and go to the John. Now, the two front rooms on my floor are a little larger, I guess, but they're pretty small, too. There's a Puerto Rican family in one of them, a husband, a wife, and some kids. I don't know how many. These people entertain a lot. And in the other front room, there's somebody living there, but I don't know who it is. I've never seen who it is. Never. Never, ever. Hmm. Well, why, why do you live there? 
I don't know. <laughs> It doesn't sound a very nice place where you live. Oh, well, no, it isn't an apartment in the East 70s. But, but then again, I don't have one wife, two cats, two daughters, and two parakeets. What I do have, I have toilet articles, a few clothes, a hot plate that I'm not supposed to have, a can opener, one that works with a key, you know. Um, a knife, two forks and two spoons, one small, one large. Uh, three plates, a cup, a saucer, a drinking glass, two picture frames, both empty, a pack of pornographic playing cards, regular deck, <laughs> and uh, an old Western Union typewriter that prints nothing but capital letters, and a small strong box without a lock, which has in it what? Rocks. Some rocks. Sea rounded rocks I picked up on the beach when I was a kid. Yeah. Under which, way down, are some letters. Please, letters. Please, why don't you do this? Please, why don't you do that? Letters. And when, letters too? When will you write? When will you come? When? These letters are from more recent years. Uh, about those two picture frames. I don't see why they need any explanation at all. <laughs> Isn't it clear? I don't have pictures of anyone to put in them. Oh, your parents, perhaps, or a girlfriend? You're a very sweet man. And you're possessed of a truly enviable innocence. Well. But good old mom and good old pop are dead. You know? Yeah, and I'm broken up about it too. I mean, really. But that particular vaudeville act is playing the cloud circuit now, so... I don't see how I could look at them all neat and framed. Besides, or rather, to be pointed about it, good old mom walked out on good old pop when I was ten and a half years old. <laughs> she embarked on an adulterous turn of our southern states, a journey of a year's duration, and her most constant companion, among others, among many others, was a Mr. Barleycorn. At least that's what Boodle Pop told me after he went down, came back, brought her body north. <laughs> We'd received the news between Christmas and New Year's, you see, that good old mom had parted with the ghost in some dump in Alabama. And without the ghost, <laughs> she was less welcome. I mean, what was she? A stiff. A northern stiff. At any rate, good old Pop celebrated the New Year for an even two weeks and then slapped into the front of a somewhat moving city omnibus which sort of cleaned things out family-wise. Oh, well, no! Then there was Mom's sister, who was given neither to sin nor the consolations of the bottle. I moved in on her, and uh, my memory of her is slight, excepting I remember still that she did all things dourly. Eating, sleeping, working, praying, she dropped dead on the stairs to her apartment, my apartment then too, on the afternoon of my high school graduation. <laughs> A terribly middle European joke, if you ask me. Oh my, oh my. Well, you're what? But well, that was a long time ago, and I have no feeling about any of it that I care to admit to myself. But perhaps you can see, though, why good old mom and good old pop are friendless. What's your name? Oh. Your first name? Peter. I've forgotten to ask. I'm Jerry. Oh, hello, Jerry. And let's see now. What, what's the point of having a girl's picture? Especially in two frames. <laughs> <laughs> I have two picture frames, you remember? Yes. yes. Well, I never see the pretty little ladies more than once. And most of them wouldn't be caught in the same room with a camera. Hmm. It's odd. And I wonder if it's sad. The girls? No, I, I wonder if it's sad that I never see the little ladies more than once. I've never been able to have sex with or, how is it put, make love to anybody more than once. Once. That's it. Oh, oh wait, for a week and a half when I was 15, and I hang my head in shame that puberty was late, I was, I was a H-O-M-O-S-E-X-U-A. I mean, I was queer. 
queer, 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 with bells ringing, banners snapping in the wind. And for those 11 days, I met twice a day with the park superintendent's son. A Greek boy whose birthday was the same as mine, except he was a year older. I think I was very much in love. Maybe just with sex. <laughs> but that was the jazz of a very special hotel, wasn't it? And now, oh, do I love the little ladies. Really, I love them. For about an hour. Well, seems perfectly clear to me. You just haven't met the no, wife. look, are you telling me to get married and have parakeets? Well, forget the parakeets. <laughs> Stay single if you want. There's no business of mine. I didn't start this conversation. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. All right? You're not angry? No, I'm not angry. Good. Interesting that you asked me about the two picture frames. I would have thought that you would have asked me about the pornographic playing cards. Oh, well, I've seen those cards. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> I suppose when you were a kid, you and your pals uh, passed them around, or you had a back of your own. Well, I suppose a lot of us did. And you threw them away just before you got married? Well, now look, I didn't need those things when I got older. No. <laughs> discuss this sort of thing. So. Don't. But besides, I wasn't trying to plumb your post-adolescent sexual life and hard times. But what I wanted to get at is the value difference between pornographic playing cards when you're a kid and pornographic playing cards when you're older. Is that when you're a kid, you use the cards as a substitute for the real experience. And when you're older, you use the real experience as a substitute for the fantasy. But I imagine you'd rather hear about what happened at the zoo. Oh, yes, the zoo. That is, if... Well, let me tell you why I went. Well, let me tell you a few things. I told you about the fourth floor of the rooming house where I live. Um, I think the rooms are better as you go down, floor by floor. I guess they are. I don't know. I don't know any of the people on the second and third floor. Oh, wait, I do know that there's a lady living on the third floor in the front. I know because she cries all the time. Whenever I go out or come back in, whenever I pass her door, I hear her crying. Muffled, but very determined. Very determined indeed. Hmm. But, but, but the one I'm getting to, and all about the dog, is the landlady. I don't like to use words that are too harsh in describing people. I don't like to. But the landlady is a fat, ugly, mean, stupid, misanthropic, cheap, drunken bag of garbage. And you may have noticed that I very seldom use profanity, so I can describe her as well as I might. You describe her vividly. Well, thank you. Anyway, she has a dog. And she and her dog are the gatekeepers of my dwelling. The woman is bad enough. She leans around in the entrance hall, spying to see that I don't bring in things or people. And when she's had her mid-afternoon pint of lemon-flavored gin, she always stops me in the hall and grabs a hold of my coat or my arm, and she presses her disgusting body up against me to keep me in a corner so she can talk to me. The smell of her body and her breath, you can't imagine it. And somewhere, Somewhere in the back of that pea-sized brain of hers, an organ developed just enough to let her eat, drink, and emit, she has some foul parody of sexual desire. And I, Peter, am the object of her sweaty lust. Disgusting. That's horrible. But I have found a way to keep her off. When she talks to me, when she mumbles about her room and how I should come there, I merely say, but love, wasn't yesterday enough for you? And the day before? <laughs> then she puzzles. She makes slits of her tiny eyes. She sways a little. And then Peter. And it is at this moment that I think I might be doing something good in that tormented house. A simple-minded smile begins to form on her unthinkable face. And she giggles and groans as she thinks about yesterday and the day before, as she believes and relives 
what never happened. <laughs> then she motions to that black monster of a dog she has, and she goes back to her room, and I am safe until our next meeting. <sighs> it's hard to believe such people really are. It's what we're reading about, isn't it? Yes. Then fact is better left to fiction. You're right, Peter. But, but what I've been meaning to tell you about is the dog. I shall now. The dog? Yes. Do, do, you're not thinking of going, are you? No, no. no because after I tell you about the dog, then do you know what then? Then I'll tell you about what happened at the zoo. You're just full of stories, aren't you? You don't have to listen. I know that. Nobody's holding you here, remember that? Yes. You do? I know. Okay. Good. The story of Jerry and the dog. What I'm going to tell you has something to do with how sometimes it's necessary to go a long distance out of the way in order to come back a short distance correctly. Uh, or maybe I only think it has something to do with that, but, but, but that's why I went to the zoo today and why I walked north. Northerly, rather, until I came here. All right, the dog. I think I told you, is a black monster of a beast. An oversized head, tiny, tiny ears and eyes, bloodshot, infected maybe. And a body, you can see the ribs through the skin. The dog is black. All black. All black except for the bloodshot eyes and, uh, and oh yes, and an open sore on its right forepaw. That is red too. And, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> the poor monster, and I do believe it's an old dog, it's certainly a misused one, almost always has an erection of sorts. That is red, too. And, uh, what else? Oh, yes. There's a gray, yellow, white color, too, when he bears his fangs like this. Which is what he did when he saw me for the first time, the day I moved in. I worried about that animal the very first minute I met him. Now, animals don't take to me like Saint Francis had birds hanging off him all the time. But what I mean is, animals are indifferent to me. Like people, most of the time. But this dog wasn't indifferent. From the very beginning, he'd snarl and then go for me to get one of my legs. But not like he was rabid, you know, I was sort of a stumbly dog. He wasn't half-assed either. It was a good stumbly run. But I always got away. He got a piece of my trouser leg. Look, you see right here where it's mended? He got that the second day I lived there. But I kicked free and got upstairs fast, so that was that. I still don't know to this day how the other rumors manage it. But do you know what I think? I think it had only to do with me. Cozy. Anyway, this went on for over a week. Whenever I came in, but never when I went out. Ha! <laughs> That's funny. Or, it was funny. I could pack up and live in the street for all the dog cared. So, I thought about it up in my room one day, and I made up my mind. I decided, first, I'll kill the dog with kindness. And if that doesn't work, I'll just kill him. Uh, don't react, Peter. Just, just listen. <laughs> so, I went out the next day and bought a bag of hamburgers. Medium rare, no ketchup, no onion. And on the way home, I threw away all the rolls and kept just the meat. When I got back to the rooming house, the dog was waiting for me. I half opened the door that led into the entrance hall, and there it was, waiting for me. It figured. So I went in, very cautiously, and I had the hamburgers, you remember. I opened the bag, and I set the meat down about 12 feet from where the dog was snarling at me. Like so. He snarled. Stopped snarling. Sniffed. Moved slowly. Then faster, then faster toward the meat. Well, when he got to it, he stopped, and he looked at me. I smiled, but tentatively, you understand. Then he turned his face back to the hamburgers, smelled, sniffed some more, 
and then <laughs> like that. He tore into them. It was as if he had never eaten anything in his life before except like garbage. Which might very well have been the truth. I don't think the landlady ever eats anything but garbage. But he finished all the hamburgers almost all at once, making sounds in his throat like a woman. Then when he finished the meat, the hamburgers, and tried to eat the paper too, he sat down and smiled. <laughs> I think he smiled. I know cats do. It was a very gratifying few moments. And then, BAM! He snarled and made for me again. Well, he didn't get me this time either, so I got upstairs, and I lay on my bed, and I started to think about the dog again. <sighs> to be truthful, I was offended, and I was damn mad too. It was Six perfectly good hamburgers with not enough pork in them to make it disgusting. I was offended. But after a while, I decided to try it for a few more days. But if you think about it, this dog had what amounted to an antipathy toward me. Really? And I wondered if I mightn't overcome this antipathy. So I tried it for five more days, but it was always the same. Snarl, sniff, move, faster, stare, blah, 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 blah smile, snarl, bam! <laughs> well, by this time, Columbus Avenue was strewn with hamburger rolls, and I was less offended than disgusted, so I decided to kill the dog. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be so alarmed, Peter, I didn't succeed. The day that I tried to kill the dog, I bought only one hamburger, and what I thought was a murderous portion of rat poison. When, when I bought the hamburger, I told the guy not to bother with the rolls. All I wanted was the meat. I expected some reaction from him. Like, um, we don't sell no hamburgers without rolls. Or, what do you want to do? Get it out of your hands? But no. He smiled benignly, wrapped the hamburger in wax paper, and said, A bite for your pussycat? I wanted to say, No, not really. It's part of a plan to poison a dog I know. But you can't say a dog I know without sounding funny, so I said, a little too loud, I'm afraid, and too formally, yes, a bite for my pussycat. People looked up. It always happens when I try to simplify things. People look up. But that's neither hither nor thither, so on my way back to the rooming house, I needed the hamburger and the rat poison together between my hands, feeling at that point as much sadness as disgust. I, when I got to the, back to the rooming house, I opened the door to the entrance hall, and there the monster was, waiting to take the offering and then jump me. <laughs> Poor bastard. He never did learn that the moment he took to smile before he went for me, gave me time enough to get out of range. But there he was, malevolence with an erection, waiting. I put the poison patty down, moved toward the stairs, and watched. The poor animal gobbled the food down as usual, smiled, which made me almost sick, and then BAM! But I sprinted up the stairs as usual, and the dog didn't get me as usual. And it came to pass that the beast was deathly ill. I knew this because he no longer attended me and because the landlady sobered up. <laughs> she stopped me in the hall the same evening of the attempted murder and confided the information that God had struck her puppy dog a surely fatal blow. She had forgotten her bewildered lust, and her eyes were wide open for the first time. They looked like the dog's eyes. She snivelled and implored me to pray for the animal. I wanted to say to her, Madam, I have myself to pray for, the Puerto Rican family, the Black Queen, the person in the front room whom I've never seen, and the rest of the people in all rooming houses everywhere. Besides, madam, I don't understand how to pray. But to simplify things, I told her I would pray. She looked up. She said that I was a liar and that I probably wanted her dog to die. <laughs> I told her, and there was so much truth in there, that I didn't want the dog to die. I didn't, and not just because I poisoned him. 
I'm afraid that I must tell you I wanted the dog to live so that I could see what our new relationship might come to. Please understand, Peter, that sort of thing is important. We need to know the effect of our actions. Well, anyway, the dog recovered. I have no idea why, unless he was a descendant of the puppy that guarded the gates of hell or some such resort. I'm not up to my mythology. Are you? Well, anyway, and you've missed the $8,000 question, Peter. At any rate, the dog recovered his health and the landlady, the landlady recovered her thirst in no way altered by the Bow Wow's deliverance. When I came home from a movie that was playing on 42nd Street, a movie I'd seen or one that was very much like one or several I'd seen, after the landlady told me Bubbikins was better, I was so hoping for the dog to be waiting for me. I was, how would you put it, um, enticed, fascinated, I don't think so. Heart-shatteringly anxious. That's it. I was heart-shatteringly anxious to confront my friend again. Yes, Peter? Friend. That's the only word for it. I was heart-shatteringly, etc., to confront my doggy friend again. I came in the door and advanced, unafraid, to the center of the entrance hall. The beast was there looking at me. And you know, he looked better for his quake with a never mind. I looked at him. He looked at me. I think, I think we stayed a long time that way. Still, stone statue. Just looking at one another. I looked more into his face than he looked into mine. I mean, I, mean, I can concentrate longer at looking into a dog's face than a dog can look into mine, or, or into anybody else's face for that matter. But for that 20 seconds or two hours that we looked into each other's face, we made contact. Now, here is what I wanted to happen. I love the dog now. And I wanted him to love me. I had tried to love and I had tried to kill. And both had been unsuccessful by themselves. I hope that uh, I don't really know why I expected the dog to understand anything, much less my motivations, but I hope that the dog would understand. just that if you can't deal with people, you have to make a start somewhere. With animals, don't you see? A person has to find a way to, to deal with something. With, with a bed, with a cockroach, with, with a mirror. No, no, that's too hard. That's, that's one of the last steps. With, with, a, with a carpet, with, with a roll of toilet paper. No, oh, not that either. <laughs> That's a mirror too. <laughs> Always check bleeding. With, you see how hard it is to find things? With, with, with a street corner. With a wisp of smoke. A wisp of smoke with, with pornographic playing cards. With, with, a, with a strong box without a lock. With, with, with vomiting, with love, with crying, with fury because the pretty little ladies aren't pretty little ladies. With making money with your body, which is an act of love. And I could prove it. With howling because you're alive. With, with God, who is a black queen who wears a kimono and plucks his eyebrows. Who is a woman who cries with determination behind her closed door. With God. With God. who I'm told turned his back on the whole thing some time ago.
with someday with people. jail. Where better to communicate one sim single simple-minded idea than, than an entrance hall? Where? It would be a start. Where better to make a beginning? To understand and just possibly be understood. A beginning of understanding than with with a dog. Just that. A dog. <clears throat> a dog. <laughs> it seemed like a perfectly sensible idea. <laughs> a, a, man's, a man is a dog's best friend, remember? <laughs> so, so the dog and I looked at each other, I longer than the dog. And what I saw then has been the same ever since. Whenever the dog and I see each other, we regard each other with a mixture of sadness and suspicion. And then we fade in difference. We walk past each other safely. We have an understanding. It's very sad, but you have to admit that it is an understanding. We had tried many attempts at contact and we had failed. The dog has returned to garbage and I to solitude but free passage. Mm -hmm. I have not returned, I mean to say, I have gained solitary free passage. If that much further loss can be said to be gained. I have learned that neither kindness nor cruelty by themselves, independent of each other, can create any effect beyond themselves. And I have learned that the two combined together at the same time are the teaching emotion. And what is gained is loss. And what has been the result? The dog and I have attained a compromise. More of a bargain, really. We neither love nor hurt because we do not try to reach each other. And was trying to feed the dog an act of love? And was the dog's attempt to bite me not an act of love? we can so misunderstand, then, then why have we invented the word love in the first place? The story of Jerry and the dog. The end. story to the Reader's Digest and make a couple of hundred bucks for the most unforgettable character I've ever met. Huh? <laughs> oh, come on now, Peter, tell me what you think. I don't understand. I don't think... Uh, why did you tell me all this? Well, why not? I don't understand. Well, that's a lie. No, no, it's not. I, I try to explain it to you as I went along. I went slowly. It all has to do with... I don't want to hear anymore. I don't understand you or your landlady or her dog. Her dog? 
<laughs> I thought it was my... Oh no, you're right. <laughs> it is our dog. I don't know what I was thinking about. Of course you don't understand. I don't live in your block. I'm not married to two parakeets or whatever your setup is. <laughs> I'm a permanent transient. And my home is the sickening rooming houses on the west side of New York City, which is the greatest city in the world. Amen! And I'm here. And I'm not leaving. <sighs> Well, you may not be leaving, but I must be getting home soon. Oh, come on, stay a little while longer. I really must be getting back, you see. Oh, come on. No, I really... Oh, come on! Don't do that! <laughs> oh, stop! Oh, stop! The parakeets are standing there! <laughs> I should tell you why I went to the zoo. I went to the zoo to find out more about the way people exist with animals and the way animals exist with each other. And with people too. Yeah. It probably wasn't a fair test, what with everyone separated by bars from everyone else. The animals for the most part from each other and always the people from the animals. But, but if it's a zoo, that's the way it is. Uh, move over. Oh, sorry, aren't you going to brew? Uh, so, all the animals are there, and all the people are there, and it's Sunday, and all the children are there. Uh, move over. All right. And uh, it's a hot day, so all the stench is there too. And, and all the balloon sellers, and the ice cream sellers, and the seals are barking, and the birds are screaming. Uh, move over. Here, you have more than enough room. <sighs> And I'm there, and it's feeding time at the lion's house. And the lion keeper comes into the lion cage, one of the lion cages, to feed one of the lions. Move over! I can't move over anymore! <laughs> Stop hitting me! What's the matter with you? Do you want to hear the story? I'm not so sure! So you don't want to get punched in the arm! Like that? Stop that! What's the matter with you? I'm crazy, you bastard! <laughs> that isn't funny. Listen to me, Peter. I want this bench. Now, you go sit on the bench over there, oh, and if you're good, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Wow. <laughs> Whatever for? Besides, I see no reason why I should give up this bench. I sit on this bench almost every Sunday, weather permitting. It's secluded here, nobody's ever sitting here, and I have it all to myself. Get off this bench, Peter, I want it. No. I said I want this bench, and I'm going to have it. Now get over there. People can't have everything they want. That's a rule, don't you know that? People can have some of the things they want, but they can't have everything. Imbecile. You're slow-witted. Stop that. You're a vegetable. Go lie down on the ground. Now listen, Bill. I put up with you all afternoon. <coughs> Not really. Long enough! I put up with you long enough. I listened to you because you seemed... Well, because I thought you wanted to talk to somebody. Well, you put things well. Economically, and yet, oh, what is the word I want to put justice to your Jesus, you make me sick! But get off here and give me my bench! My bench? Get out of my sight! Stop that! How dare you! I've had enough of you! This is my bench and I'm not leaving, and that is that! Now go away! Go away, I said. Get out of here. If you don't move on, you're a bum. That's what you are. If you don't move on, I'll call a policeman and make you go. Oh, I'll call a policeman. You won't find a policeman around here. 
They're all over on the west side of the park chasing fairies down from trees or out of the bushes. That's all they do. That's their function. So, scream your head off. It won't do you any good. Police! I warn you, I'll have you arrested. Police! I said police! I feel ridiculous. You look ridiculous. A grown man screaming for the police on a bright Sunday afternoon in the park with nobody harming you? <laughs> if a policeman did feel his quota and come sludging over this way, he'd probably take you in as a nut. God, I've just come here to read and now you want me to give up the bench? You're mad! Hey, I got news for you, as they say. I'm on your precious bench and you're never going to have it for yourself again. Look, you. Get off my bench! Oh, look who's mad. <sighs> Get out! No. Get away from my bench! You know how ridiculous you look now. I don't care! Get away from my bench! Why? You have everything in the world you want. You've told me about your family and your home and your own little zoo. You have everything and now you want this bench. What is the things men fight for? Tell me, Peter, is this bench, this iron and this wood, is this your honor? Is this the thing in the world that you'd fight for? <laughs> Can you think of anything more absurd? Absurd! <sighs> Look, I'm not going to talk about honor or even try to explain it to you. Besides, it's not even a question of honor. If it were, you wouldn't understand. You don't even know what you're saying, do you? This is probably the first time in your life you've had anything more trying to face than changing your cat's toilet box. Stupid. Don't you have any idea? Not even the slightest what other people need. Oh, boy, listen to you. Well, you don't need this bench, that's for sure. Yes, yes, I do. I've come here for years. I've spent hours of great pleasure, great satisfaction right here. And that's very important to a man. I am a grown-up, and I am responsible. This is my bench, and you have no right to take it away from me. Fight for it, then. Defend yourself. Defend your bench. Push me to it. Get up and fight. Like a man. Yes, like a man if you insist on mocking me further. I'll have to give you credit for one thing. You are a vegetable. And a slightly nearsighted one, I think. That's you, enough! You know, <laughs> as they say on TV all the time, you know, and I mean this, Peter, you have a certain dignity. It, it, it's surprising. Stop! Very well, Peter. We'll battle for the bench. But we're not evenly matched. You're mad! You stop raving that, you're gonna kill me! There you go. Pick it up. You have the knife, then we'll be more evenly matched. No! Now you pick up that knife and you fight with me. You fight for your self-respect. You fight for that goddamn bench. No! You hell! fight, you miserable bastard. Fight for yourself. Fight for that goddamn bench, you pathetic little vegetable. You couldn't even get your wife with a male child. It's a matter of genetics, not manhood. This is your last chance. Now you go away and leave me alone! Are you awake? Are you awake? The parakeets are making. 
making the dinner. <laughs> the cats are saying the 